It's been a year since the deadly and tragic Covenant Christian School massacre right here in Nashville. On March 27, 2023, right down the road, 28-year-old transgender Aubrey Hale infiltrated the Covenant School on a quest to slaughter innocent Christians. Her rampage came to an end after brave Metro Nashville officers took her down. Six innocent people lost their lives that day, including three kids under the age of 10. Nothing can bring back those innocent lives, and we mourn them as much today as we did a year ago. But beyond the intense grief our Nashville community felt in the aftermath of this tragedy, many of us to this day are mystified and downright enraged that we still do not have all the answers. We knew shortly after the massacre occurred that several journals belonging to the shooter were uncovered, but authorities and even lawsuits went to great lengths to keep them from the public. Why, you ask? Well, the contents, of course. Several months ago, the long-awaited and long-buried snippets from that manifesto were leaked by a conservative media pundit, Stephen Crowder. They expose a motivation and driving force behind the slaughter that's even darker than we speculated. The scribbles titled Death Day discuss the trans shooter's desire to kill white people with white privileges. The shooter also gloats about being ready to kill and ready to die doing it, and those are just the parts I can read aloud to you on this platform. But let's be clear, these writings were never released by the authorities as is typical for other manifestos. They were leaked. The full manifesto remains buried. And as it turns out, it's not just the LGBTQ sympathizers that want the trans shooters manifesto under lock and key, but also many of the parents from the Covenant School. But why? Joining me now today to discuss that, to debate gun restrictions, and to revisit and make sense of what happened that day are two Covenant School moms, the co-founders of Covenant Families for Brighter Tomorrows, Mary Joyce and Melissa Alexander. Join me now. Melissa, I want to start with you on that day. Obviously, my audience has heard a lot and the Nashville community knows a lot about the timeline, how it went down, and we've heard some from parents like yourselves, but I don't think anybody has a true reality of what that day was like for a parent. And I'd like you both just to kind of walk through, but I'd like to start with you and tell me what happened on that morning. Well, if, if I were to define the day in one word, it would be a nightmare, right? I mean, it is everybody's worst nightmare to find out that there, there has been an active shooter at their school and there's one ongoing. Um, because our, our school being on lockdown, we did not get an alert from the school itself. I was on Zoom working and I got a phone call from an unknown number. And I thought, that's strange. I looked back, I had gotten that phone call from that same number two times prior, two minutes before. I answered the phone call and on the phone was my son. And he was crying out to me to come save him. And I put two and two together because an email had just flashed up from my daughter's school who was at a, di she had graduated from Covenant. She was at a different school, wow. but it said, we are on lockdown, pray for Covenant. Between that phone call, my son saying, mommy, come save me. And seeing that email flash, I knew in an instant what had happened. And I immediately hopped in my car and I drove as fast as I could to the site. And when you were on the phone, with your son, was this ongoing as he was okay. calling you? Okay, no, and this is where I get a little bit upset because I, he was so loud, Tommy, in the phone. He was screaming and I thought, I knew that something was ongoing and I knew it had just happened and I was so worried about him being too loud and being heard right. by somebody who was trying to kill him. And so I said, I love you. I'm on my way, and I did the hardest thing I've ever done, and I hung up the phone. Just because you wanted to get there as quickly as possible, and you didn't want him to I be loud. I didn't want him to be loud anymore, and I didn't want him, I didn't want to alarm him, because the, immediately when I hung up the phone, I was driving and screaming like a wild animal. Mary Joyce, what was the day like for you? I mean, it started out in a very routine um, scenario. So we dropped our kids off. I remember the sun was shining. It was so beautiful that day. And we all said goodbye and high fived. And the school teachers uh, took our kids from drop off or from drop off from our cars. And I 
was running a little behind to a meeting. We were onboarding two new people to our business, my husband and I. And we sat down at the table. And that morning, I had already been in this group mom thread about jazz shoes because there was a play that Friday. And we had to send to school certain items with our daughters um, for the play. And so it was buzzing back and forth about what shoes, et cetera. And my phone was just blowing up as I sat down for this meeting. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. This is my thread with the moms about shoes. And I picked it up and I read the text that is the hardest thing I've ever seen in my life. And it said, hardest text I've ever had to send, but there's an active shooter at our school. And at the, in the moment, it felt, I felt completely helpless because we couldn't do anything. And so at that moment, we, I looked at my husband and I was like, I, we have to go. And, um, we did. And luckily we were together and he drove and I was screaming at him to drive faster and get to the school. And we got to the school and, um, everything, we got to the intersection outside of our school on a major road and everything was blocked off. And I don't even remember him stopping his truck I just remember getting out of that, like swinging open the door and just running as fast as I could up Hillsboro and running almost like I was in a dream because I couldn't get there fast enough. And it was it was the worst experience of our life at that moment because all I wanted to do was get to my child and make sure she was safe. And you didn't know at that point if your daughter had been harmed if, you know, what had happened, who had been lost, you guys were nothing. We had no point. idea. No idea. Mm -mm. And so uh, my group mom thread is uh, still going off. And so I'm getting dinged. An officer stopped me halfway up this road um, and said, you have to, you can't go up there. Um, you have to go to, at, this, at the time, it was the reunification site. And, and we got there and it was... It was horrific. It was heavy, and we didn't know anything. We didn't know who who was lost, if anyone was was dead or alive or still ongoing. We had no idea. I want to go to what your kids experienced. The thing, God, neither were harmed, but their classmates, unfortunately, were part of this and, and were taken by this tragedy. But... I know that they have obviously a vivid remembrance of what that day was like. I'm sure they've shared it with you many times. I'm sure it's something that they're still working through. But as this was happening, as this shooter was going through the hallways, I mean, it, it was chaos. And we've heard a lot of reports about kind of what happened. We've seen the body cam footage. But what was the experience like in the school? What have your children told you about that day and what they saw? Tommy, it, it was a war zone inside the school. So I just, it's something that, and mind you, this is an el elementary school. These are things that kids don't even watch movies about, right? Mm -hmm. So they've never been exposed to this kind of violence. Um, this, the fire alarm went off because of the entry into the building. And um, because that fire alarm went off, their immediate reaction was to exit the classroom. And... Um, so I'll let Mary Joyce talk about that. Both of our kids were on the second floor, and that's where um, ev most everybody except for Mr. Hill passed away. Um, so um, the way our school is constructed, our classrooms were upstairs, as Melissa said, and the children heard the fire alarms going off, and we could all do a fire drill in our sleep. Mm -hmm. And the protocol is they line up at the door, they get in a nice, straight, quiet line, and they start to leave. And what happened in third grade that day was they, the classrooms lined up, and the protocol is that the teacher stays behind and sweeps the classroom to make sure no children, all the children are out, right? Because it's a fire drill. So the third graders started to leave the classroom, and at that moment is when the shooter came up the stairwell and just started shooting. And the teachers very quickly called all the children back into the classrooms, closed the door, and tried to pull down shades. 
um, our shade could not got stuck. And so our shade was up and exposing the window to our classroom. And Monroe, my daughter, um, who was nine at the time, described it as chaos. She didn't know what to do. All she heard was the teacher saying, get down, hide, be quiet. And as children, it takes us five times to tell them to tie their shoes. Mm -hmm. And in the moment, she knew, I, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but I think I'm supposed to get down. So she gets down and underneath a table closest to the door, feet from the door. And she remembers looking up after they're hiding, and she could see the shooter standing outside of the third grade classroom doors, shooting into their classrooms. Gun smoke everywhere, flashes of light. She said they were fireworks going off in our classroom. And she said it was so loud and so smoky, she, they thought they were going to like suffocate. And papers are everywhere. Their desks are just being blown apart. There's glass breaking everywhere. And the children, meanwhile, are just hiding under these tables and these desks. And when it got quiet, she crawled over all the glass and broken water bottles and backpacks and sweatshirts to get to her teacher in the safe corner. And... As she exited, she said she saw a little shoe in the hallway and they thought their friends had fainted because, as you said, they don't even understand death and war and destruction like that. They just don't. Their minds don't even go there. Right. And and for you, uh -huh. what was the experience uh -huh. as far as seeing the shooter, not seeing the shooter? Uh -huh. The classmates, I mean, I, I can't even imagine what it's like for a young child to go through that, let alone have to explain what they saw. But I'm sure it's an unpacking, even a year later, still unpacking everything that was seen and heard that day. Yeah, and my son doesn't like to talk about it, right. um, and which is normal, I've learned. But while the, while the shooting was going on in the third grade classrooms, the fourth grade classrooms realized quickly what was happening. And their teacher had the wherewithal to grab them and pull them back in the room. Granted, we were around the corner, so they didn't see the active shooter shooting into the two classrooms, but they could hear there was 152 rounds that went off. Right. And I would say probably 20 to 30 in each of those two small classrooms, one of which Mary Joyce's child was, was in. So they could hear that pulled back in, but the teacher's hands, and this is, this is a testimony we give at the Capitol, the teacher's hands were shaking so bad she couldn't get the door to lock. Wow. So she knew that the door was not secure, and, but she shut it. And you have to realize, like, I, I envision there is a closet or some, some place where the kids can feel somewhat safe. They're not in a closet, Tommy. They're against a wall. And they're just standing there, lined up, as trying to be as quiet as they can, saying their goodbyes, telling each other they love each other. One grabbed the Bible and read the Bible. And they just sat there and they waited to be next. And so it was... I think by God's providence that for whatever reason, we did get the shade pulled down in our classroom, that they saw her feet walk by the room. Um, and then by that time, our heroes at Metro Police had entered the facility and they had come upon the shooter and obviously dispelled the, the active shooter situation on the other side of my child's classroom. So they said, we could hear a different type of gunshot at that point. And we knew something had changed. Um, and so they were spared that day. Your daughter still has lasting physical remnants of what happened. Can you, can you talk about that? Yeah. So this is something that, you know, there is no playbook after this happens. And as a parent, I have my child back, but there are holes that are missing from her. And we, after the shooting, everything just, every, nothing felt the same. And so we took the kids on a vacation just to get as far away as possible 
and we're on the airplane and she had these headphones and she's like, mommy, my headphones are not working. And I thought, oh, well, cause mommy got some cheap headphones. Sorry. <laughs> you know? Um, and then we went to the pediatrician after our trip just for a routine check. And we discovered that she's lost 50% of her hearing in her left side and her right side has some decline as well. And it's one of those physical injuries that we didn't even, you don't even think to look for. And I would never, I would never even think that that could happen. But if you think about what you do, if you go to a gun range or if you go sports shooting, you put on protective ear coverings. And in a classroom where there is a shooter shooting at you, um, no one passes out ear covering saying, right. get ready, right? And so on top of the mental um, injury that our children are healing from, um, that's something that is, that's going to be lasting with her. Right. As far as the mental part of that, mm -hmm. I'm sure neither of you ever thought that your young children would have to be in, in therapy for trauma, you know, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. And it, mm -hmm. for people that are not familiar with mm -hmm. Nashville, they're not familiar with this area. For us, we know it. But for a national audience, I mean, this is obviously a very nice part of town. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful, celebrated school. People in Nashville probably thinking this might be one of the premier places to send your child, one of the safest environments. Um, Beautiful families. I mean, it really is you know, your picture perfect from the outside looking in of what a beautiful Southern school would look like. So I'm sure neither of you ever anticipated in your wildest dreams that something like this would happen. But in the aftermath of it, your daughter lost classmates. You've got a school mourning. You've got a community mourning. What does that look like to pick up the pieces with a young child? You said your son doesn't like to talk about it. I'm mm -hmm. sure that there has been therapy and, and other things that you've done to try to get him to a place where he has some resolve. But can you both speak to that and what as parents you guys have done to try to put the pieces back together? I mean, we obviously tried to be there as much as possible, our whole community for our children and for one another. The, the blessing in this is the Nashville community has been incredible and there was an outpouring of support and financial means to help us get back in, on our feet and go to therapy and do the things that we need. The school has been amazing um, in that sense as well. And we've kind of become this really tight knit um, Christian community of, people, of believers who are re like relying on each other. Um, my son, I would say, you know, Mary Joyce says there's pieces of her daughter missing. What I noticed was when I dropped my son off at school that day, he was a nine year old young little boy. Mm -hmm. When I picked him up, I saw somebody who seemed to be 20 or 25. He was just a different demeanor than what I had taken to school that morning. Mm -hmm. And so we are, and, and trauma is not linear. And so some days are better than others. And we have to navigate things that you wouldn't think about, like if a fire alarm goes off again, right. that will immediately, you know, put put that trauma back on them. They'll bring them back to that moment. Even sirens and things like that. You have to yeah. think about your environment and how you can help them adjust and deal with the, the new sound, the sounds that they're, that they relate to that day for the day of the shooting. Yesterday, Monroe um, heard someone banging. We're at a temporary location right now, um, which I'd love to talk about as well mm -hmm. okay um someone was in the cafeteria banging on some be frozen vegetables um for dinner that night at the church and monroe heard this loud just kind of repetitive banging and it triggered her into a really scary place and we have done so many therapies um we did a brain scan and it showed that her body is still in fight or flight mode so all these months later, we're almost to a year, and she is still looking always for a way out. Where am I going to hide? What's around me? And she's, she just turned 10. I want her to be concerned with, can I have a sleepover this mm -hmm. Friday, right? Or can I stay up a little extra late? Or what camps am I going to this summer? 
not, is there a bad guy that's going to shoot at me or kill me today? Right. Let's talk about a year later. Um, is the school going to reopen in that same location? And if so, are you both comfortable with that? Is it possible to re-enter that building and not be re-traumatized on a daily basis? So we, yeah, I mean, I think there's probably pe different people on, in different places right now, Tommy. We go to church there. We have had exposure to the building um, pretty early on. And even, even when I do walk in, I still think about what happened. But my, my family's take is I don't want evil to win the day. I want to take back that beautiful space for our beautiful community. And so that my son says he's excited and ready to go back. I know that it's not going to all be easy, but I don't want to let that evil win either. Right. And that's the same feeling that, that you have about the building and the space. I think I go, um, I'm 50, 50. <laughs> Um, Monroe has shared that she does not want to go back to that space, um, but she's open to trying it with her friends. Her experience was so different. The third grade's experience, now fourth grade's experience, was so different. Um, being directly shot at is, right. is just a very hard feeling to settle when you're walking into the same space. Um, something that we're keeping in mind as a community and they've reminded us and coached us as parents is our feelings and our comprehension and um, processing of what happened that day is different than our children. And so they may walk back in and mm -hmm. see a completely different space, different classrooms, different colors, et cetera, and not feel anything that we're feeling. Right. So we're really working to try and stay neutral, but it is hard. It's hard. I mean, we have gone to church at Covenant, and it feels different than pulling up and dropping off our children and then leaving. Right. I can only imagine. We have to get into some of the, you know, the points um, that the national community has talked about when mm -hmm. it comes to the tragedy here. And I want to get into it in, in a lot of different layers here and have a real discussion. I know that you guys are advocates. I know that you guys have been wanting to have these discussions and have been, you know, seeking out the opportunities to do so, which is probably not the same for all the parents at the school. Some probably don't want any of the spotlight and they don't want to talk about it. So we thank you for being so open. I want to talk about in the aftermath of it. Um, as someone who does what I do and, and talking about politics and seeing how the national media responds to things, I can't even imagine what it's like for you, but just as somebody who lives in Nashville, to see the discussions happening in the national media, not only about the tragedy, but about the protection of the LGBTQ community and how we need to be, you know, empathetic to that community. Um, that bothered me. And I think people were some somewhat enraged by that, um, whether they were in the Nashville community or, or not. The emphasis that was placed on the shooter and the shooter's identity and coddling that identity, it did seem to be a national discussion. So I want to get your take on it, just quite honestly, the way that you saw this play out and the way that you saw our vice president talk about it, our first lady talk about it, and really putting what seemed to be a focus on the shooter more so than the victims in the school. How did that feel for both of you? Um, well, first, I think that's a valid question. I'm glad you bring that up. I think that it is important to us as Christian women to also acknowledge that the the shooter's parents lost their daughter as well. Um, I don't like to say her name because I don't want to give any mm -hmm. spotlight or emphasis or infamy to someone who did this um, to our community. Um, there's also been talk about a, 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 a manifesto, um, and I don't know if we want to talk about that or not. Oh, yeah, we're going to. Okay. We're definitely <laughs> going to get into that. Yeah. Um, well, let's just let's jump into that conversation then. Okay. Because I know that there are a lot of people, myself included, when we saw, you know, the manifesto is not coming out. Usually when something tragic happens, um, if there is a manifesto, there is writings, there's journalings, there's motivation that's been documented. Usually that's released in pretty short order. We've seen that with multiple shootings when there's a manifesto involved, if somebody's doing something for racist reasons, they're setting out, you know, in, in kind of a hate crime. We have that motivation usually within 
hours, maybe days. But when it comes to this, we knew that this person identified as transgender, but we didn't really get a lot of information about, hey, this is the motivation or this is what could have caused that. A lot of people, myself included, were like, okay, if there's all these journalings and there's all this documentation, why in this scenario does the public not know? And I know that you two are very passionate about mm -hmm. that. And the school mm -hmm. kind of went to lengths to keep this, this manifesto, these journalings, whatever you want to call it, hidden in private. Please explain, you know, why you'd want this to stay below the radar. So there's actually three points. Um, so I'm glad that you acknowledge that they are writings as well. And that's all that they are. Um, manifesto, I think, got thrown out early on and it was just an easy kind of buzzword. And um, you are a good reporter. So I know that, you know, as a journalist, you want correct information out there. And they did confiscate quite like 10 plus like, years worth of journals and laptops and etc. from um, her home. And it was of a crazy person. So you or I would look at this and think, this doesn't make any sense. Um, so why, to address your question about why it's not been released yet, um, a few things. One, um, it is an active investigation and we do respect our law enforcement. We don't want to jeopardize them finding potentially an accomplice, um, which it could if it uh, revealed certain pages where someone was helping the shooter to carry out this horrific event. Um, two, we want to also protect our children and their identity and um, our school. Um, so there were plans in there, right? Like layouts of the school and she had planned for a, a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And so to have some of those plans and, and names of people be, I'm sure she wrote down names of people. We don't, uh, first off, we haven't seen it, right? Okay. We mm -hmm. as parents haven't seen it. But from what we have heard from our briefings is there are plans from the school. She, she, spent a lot of years trying to figure out how to do this and, mm -hmm. and make her plan. Um, and so we, for the protection of our children who are going back, we don't want that, those released. Um, I will say, as parents, we are probably the most, um, seems like the most likely community of people who would want to be able to read these. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you, in the beginning, I wanted to know I want to read every single page. I want to know. I want to know who this is. And the more that I learned about this person and how mentally ill this person was, I thought, I don't, I don't think there's any logic to what they were writing. And I'm not sure that anything that I read on any page is going to be helpful. And as a matter of fact, I think it could be harmful to my child, being now that I am in the position that I'm in, all I want to do is protect my child and our community and their friends and then the children and even the few pages that were leaked. Right. If my child looks, I don't want them to look on the internet one day and see what that person wrote about wanting to kill them. What do you think? It, just put yourself in that child's shoes. If you're reading about somebody wanting you dead and wanting to kill you, how does that re-traumatize you, a person that was almost killed and hunted in the first place? And so I really thought through this, and I thought I would rather, I would, I choose not to read this. I would rather not read this. And I don't see a place for it in our society because as we know in these situations, sh those shooters study other shooters and they they feel like they have become an inspiration for the next mass shooting. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to do is see another mass shooting in a school in America. So I want to ask you about that as well, the leaked pages. Um, the leaked pages, again, they haven't been confirmed, but the way law enforcement responded to it was like, this is a leak, we're going to get to the bottom of the leak, not saying these are false or these are not mm -hmm. real, mm -hmm. saying kind of, this is a leak and we, we want to figure out why this was leaked, how it was leaked. So we have a pretty good indication that they were real, the pages mm -hmm. that were leaked. And the pages that were leaked, I've talked about them on my show. I mentioned it in the opening. They did discuss, this person did discuss kind of at length, wanting to target white people mm -hmm. with white privileges. 
people that are unfamiliar with Nashville, unfamiliar with the community. This is an area that is predominantly white, upper class area. So it seems fitting that if this person wanted to target that kind of person, that that's where they would go. And that's the type of people that they would seek out. So from those leaked pages and this targeting of white people or targeting of people with privileges, as I believe one of the leaked pages says, um, I understand completely how that would re-traumatize your children, other children. Do you think, though, that there is, when we know when you've got somebody going in and wanting to gun down people of a certain race, you know, we hear about it in the media, and it's, mm -hmm. it's not to inspire a copycat, but it's more to have a national discussion. Do you think that there's a place to have a national discussion about this person wanting to target white people with privilege? I don't know. When I think <laughs> about this... I think well, she was a white person. Okay. She and, went to the school. Right. <laughs> so she was what she was trying to attack. Um, and so I thought it was... It was it odd. Was so and strange. It just made her seem a little bit more crazy as it was. and Almost a, like an out-of-body... <laughs> out of body like she thought she was something different no no multiple she, i was thinking like multiple a different personality right. like, like like something like talking in a different voice <laughs> and different right if you if we know you that this person that. Did, when you say an out of body experience this person didn't identify as transgender so quite I, literally yeah, I, I don't know if she was transgender she either was i think she, I don't know. She was. There's just so unwell. many rumors around it that yeah. are unsubstantiated, and so yeah. Yeah. I just I, my I choose not to focus on that thing, mm -hmm. right? Like our focus is really let's take what happened to us and do good to protect the next group of people that could be targeted, right? Because um, that's all that's in the past. Whatever was written, I still think is somebody who was very extremely mentally ill. And how can we prove she was so mentally ill? She bought seven guns legally. How can we maybe rein in some of that and okay. keep those weapons out of someone's hands? So let's, let's have yeah. that discussion because I yeah. know you guys are very passionate about yes. that. And we've had this offline kind of discussion just in social settings with, with yes. both of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As many people in the Tennessee community are very passionate about our Second Amendment rights and yes. very passionate about protecting those Second Amendment rights. I think there's a discussion to be had, and I want to get your perspective. Mm -hmm. As you'd mentioned, this person was struggling with mental health. Um, this person's parents had said that they probably shouldn't have had firearms. This person legally purchased the firearms mm -hmm. over a period of time, used, I believe, three of the seven in this shooting. But there's a discussion about the red flag laws that you alluded to. Somebody with mental mental issues that are that is disturbed, that is crazy, should not have access to firearms. That's a discussion to be had. But I'm wondering, because this person wasn't institutionalized and didn't have, I guess, something go on that would have signaled law enforcement that, hey, this person shouldn't have firearms. When we talk about red flag laws, do you think that would have stopped this person from carrying out what she carried out? I, I wholeheartedly are, believe it. I do, too. And I think there are some ac actually even simpler things that we can do as a country just to implement in addition to looking at some gun safety laws that wouldn't infringe on anybody's Second Amendment rights. I mean, and that is definitely, we are very passionate about making sure that people's Second Amendment rights are protected. But perhaps we can add a few stop signs or guardrails in place to enhance responsible gun ownership and to slow down the access of someone that is unwell that it will cause harm to not only maybe just themselves, so you suicide is also a big concern, mm -hmm. um, or carrying out these horrific events. I like to preface this conversation by telling people, I'm born and raised in Tennessee. I grew up in this Nashville, Middle Tennessee area, and our family is a family of gun owners. We're a family of hunters. We have, um, you know, multiple guns, and I am still pro putting the guardrails around we're responsible gun owners right but i know there are a lot of people who are mentally incompetent or not responsible and i think i'm a, I'm a republican too so i think i think i i share a lot of commonality with the general public with tennessee i think sometimes in the media we get played against each other right and i think we're more common than not 
Um, and and I don't mind responsible gun owners having guns. That's not the issue. Mm -hmm. It really is, is how do we keep these out of the hands of people who may, like Mary Joyce said, do harm to themselves? We know the suicide rate is out of, you know, out of this world right now. Um, and suicide and mass shootings actually go together, right? A majority yeah. of the time when a mass shooting happens, that person knows that they're either go going to kill themselves with that weapon or they're gon going to be killed, right? They, they go into it knowing they're not coming out. Right. So I think that there mm -hmm. is, when we have this discussion, there's so many layers to it. Yes. And I want to best as I can represent the side of it that's very concerned about red flag laws and mm -hmm. see what you guys think about that. I agree with you. Somebody who is mentally unstable should not have a firearm. I think we can all attest to that. Mm -hmm. um, we can look and we can point fingers at the parents. Hey, if you knew this person was disturbed, they're living in your home. Why did you allow this person who is living in your home to have firearms, even though they were 28 years old? You know, I think a lot of us put a lot of responsibility on those parents, the homeowner, like you watch this person have firearms and they should have intervened. But there's also a community of people that are Second Amendment advocates that look at red flag laws and say, this is what we're worried about. Not that guns are going to be taken away from people that are legitimately disturbed, but that this law could be weaponized against people that are not mentally mm -hmm. disturbed, but that somebody wants to exact a revenge on them, wants to infringe upon their rights, wants to take away their first or their Second Amendment rights without giving them the due process that they deserve. For example, a lot of people are worried in the climate that we are in right now. Could someone go and say, you know, that person is a Trump supporter, so they shouldn't have firearms because they want to exact an insurrection. And that red flag law would be triggered, and then it would be, well, this person's not mentally disturbed. Just someone thought that because mm -hmm. they disagree with them politically or what have you. That's the concern against the red flag laws, and I'm curious to know what you guys think about that concern. I love that you bring that up because um, we actually have been to D.C. a couple times to meet with lawmakers um, and we've had discussions around this very thing. And it's important to look at states that have a, um, a red flag law implemented on um, Florida. Or a protective order, right. is what I would call it. Right. Um, <laughs> and, and it's working and it would be a felony if someone made a false claim. So it would actually be against the law. And the weapons um, that we have looked at, other states that have implemented this um, protective order, um, it, it only temporarily removes the weapons and t for a limited period of time. So it doesn't take away forever any kind of weapon. Um, and the person must be, there's a, there's a process that goes um, before any, any guns or weapons are taken away. Due process is key, and you said it, Tommy. Mm -hmm. That is key to these laws. And I think uh, the best example we have of it is the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. After the Parkland shooting in a Republican trifecta, Republican governor, Republican mm -hmm. House, Republican Senate, they passed one of these laws, and it's been working there. Um, and so, and Florida is a very conservative state, too, right? right? So I think that's a great place to start. And what we've been doing is we've met with over 70 to 80 lawmakers at this point in Tennessee, mostly Republican, across the aisle, though, to say, hey, how can we work on this and see what, what can get done? Um, it hasn't happened yet, um, but we're open to talking with firearms associations and other people. We want to just have these conversations and see how we can all come together right. from both sides mm -hmm. Because what we know is 75% of Tennesseans actually support some sort of protective order. Right. You no, know, And I think it's a discussion worth having. And I think that people do want to find a middle ground on this. Mm -hmm. I think in this environment right now, when we hear about rights under attack or threat, it makes some people very nervous about that. Yes. But I think with certain guardrails, there's a discussion to be had. The last thing I do want to talk about, though, is another element of this, and that's having our schools better protected. Yes. And there's been a lot of pushback in the media as well. There's a lot of conservatives that say, hey, listen, instead of taking guns away from gun owners and that approach, why not have armed personnel, armed law enforcement officers at every school? Because if there would have been an armed person at the school that day, they could have more than likely neutralized that threat before she was able to get in and wreak the havoc that she did. Where do you guys fall on that kind of approach? Maybe in addition to or instead of, that's a discussion for you know another time. But as far as protecting our schools better. 
So I, I like to say that, number one, I'm not against a fully trained SRO being at the school. We have them at our school and the kids love them. You know, they're, they're their pals. They're, they're, they're part of the, the school family. Right. And so I think that's a wonderful thing to have. And I think that's needed today. Um, what I worry about is some of the laws that were t- the lawmakers try to pass in Tennessee right after the shooting were to allow anybody to bring a gun on a campus if they had an eight hour um, training class, just eight hours of training and you can bring a gun. That is not, in my mind, making anything safer. That's actually creating a less safe environment. And another thing I like to say is I now that we are living out the perspective, the life of survivors and children, parents of children who are survivors, we see we just had this whole conversation about trauma. Tr- surviving isn't the goal here. So, again, if you have somebody who is in a building who is obviously armed with a much uh, smaller weapon and they're not going to carry what the shooter carried, right? They're going to have a handgun that's probably going to be on their hip. And it's really hard to go up against a semi-automatic weapon with a handgun. They're likely going to die. And um, and then you're further traumatizing those children. If you have teachers caring, the thing that we learn the most, and I want to I wanna get this out and I want it to be heard, is I told you my teacher's hands were shaking, right? right. Arming teachers, our teacher's job in both of the stories we shared were to get those kids and keep them quiet and safe and and controlled and if that teacher stepped out of that classroom to try and go up against a shooter with a much more powerful weapon the likelihood is that teacher would die and then that entire classroom of children who that teacher was protecting remember that shooter because my classroom was quiet they watched her walk by they saw her footsteps underneath the door if my teacher had gone into battle and opened that door then all of those children would be dead today right no, that's understandable, and I yeah. disagree with you on that point. I think that having yeah. trained officers that are trained to confront a threat, I do think, though, what we know from this mm-hmm. person, from the writings and whatever, is that this school was maybe targeted because the security was less than other areas that could have been targeted. So that the deterrent factor of mm-hmm. having armed, trained personnel... Even if they are confronting somebody with 10 weapons, the deterrent factor is certainly there. Same thing with your home. If you have a home that has a firearm, um, people are less likely to confront somebody who's going to fight back. So I think that that's maybe where we can have a a broader discussion about having more trained protection at school. I agree 100 percent. I think trained protection is important, especially in this day and age. Um, we also, uh, outside of um, a, an SRO or a armed officer, one of the bills that we got passed in the state was a fire alarm bill. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's because we learned that the fire alarm, alarm went off immediately in our school. And the policy of schools across the nation is to immediately evacuate the classroom right. line up them right into with, harm's way yeah right. sending the children right. out first and the right. the the captain if you will is the teacher at the end mm-hmm. yes right. and so that puts the, the the kids right out into the face of danger and so what we worked really hard on is getting this bill that is on the governor's desk now passed to say wait a second schools have to by law put a policy in place to take a moment determine if it's a real fire or an active shooter situation and then make the next step. So it's almost like a brief pause and then move along. And um, we have had mothers from across the country who learned about this and have actually approached their school boards, approached Mm -hmm. their principals, and they're changing those um, policies in their schools as well. And so we think that is like a huge win that if we can save one life, by being out here and working hard at our legislature, it's worth it, the effort. Well, you guys have done a lot, and mm-hmm. I appreciate being so open and honest yeah. and having these discussions. You know, in closing, we are at the, the anniversary. This is a year ago. I'm sure it feels like yesterday for both of you and yes. for your families. But to a national audience that has heard about this shooting, that lived through the saga of the manifesto and the trans issues and all that, what do you want a national audience to know 
about your school and the families at your school? We're a very strong community of believers. Um, we are Southern, we are Christian, and we feel as if we've done everything right to be in the right part of town, right community, et cetera. And it does not matter. Um, mass shootings can hit any kind of community. And um, we are here to just help amplify the message that we need to pay attention to how we are protecting our Second Amendment rights. And um, we as a community are stronger together. And we are still mourning. We are not out of the trauma. We have our children, but we are still putting our community back together. So we do ask that everyone continues to send their thoughts and uh, continue to you know, rally around our community and um, know that we're still hurting and healing. Right. How about you, Melissa? Well, what do you want a national audience to know, apart from what Mary Joy said about Covenant School and the community that you all have? It is a beautiful Christ-centered community of people, and I have seen so much. You know, you think that such a, we talk about the tragedy and the bad things that happen, but there have been so many beautiful things and miracles and and outpouring of love, and I'm so grateful for that outpouring from our local community, our national community. I also just want to say I've learned a lot through this political process, right? I think people need to get more involved in their local government and just pay attention to what's going on and and know what no you can meet with your legislatures le- legislators and we all have more in common than we think. And, and a lot of these closed doors, door conversations have been very productive. And we have a great rapport with our governor and with our, our state legislators. And so I think that's a beautiful thing. And I, I love that opening up the door to conversations has really brought our community together. Well, we love to hear that. Yeah. And we're obviously all still thinking about your school, your families, and we're hoping that your children are able to, in some ways, heal from it. They'll never forget it, but move forward. And thank you guys again so much for being here and and telling the story because it's one that certainly needs to be heard. I appreciate you guys so much for that. That is going to do it for this special episode of Tommy Lahren is Fearless. Once again, our deepest condolences go out to the Covenant School families, survivors, the entire community. We will never forget from Nashville. God bless you all. Take care.